I'm Lawton Snyder, CEO of the Ioneer Foundation, and you're joining us for Sight and Sound Bite, our biweekly uh, webinar series brought to you by the Ioneer Foundation. Um, today's topic, which we're very excited about, is Pittsburgh's New Vision Institute, a resource for the community. And you're going to get to hear about the New Vision Institute um, in a little bit from our um, very distinguished lecturer. I'm Lawton Snyder, as I said, CEO of the Ioneer Foundation. We support research here at the University of Pittsburgh um, in the departments of ophthalmology, otolaryngology, and the focus of our, our research is on vision, hearing, balance, uh, voice, and cancers of the head and neck in these two world-renowned departments in the Department of Ophthalmology and Otolaryngology at the University of Pittsburgh. The funds we provide from the Ioneer Foundation support research are only made possible because of philanthropic support. So thank every one of you who have supported us in the past. And of course, we're uh, easy to uh, find if you wanna do so in the future. A few housekeeping items for today's program. Chat is disabled. So, um, uh, but if you uh, would please use the Q&A function to ask questions, I'm sure we'll have lots of them and, uh, and we'll get to those questions at the end of the presentation. Please refrain from personal health questions, but we're happy to answer personal health questions if you want to email Mr. Smith um, after today's program or anytime um, after. And um, please feel free to use the subtitles. Um, this uh, is a presentation by uh, Dr. Jose Elaine Sahel. He's our distinguished professor and chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology at the Ioneer and the Ioneer Foundation Endowed Chair at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, an exceptional class professor at Sorbonne University in Paris. Dr. Sahel, thank you for joining us. And um, we're very excited to have you here to tell us about this new Vision Institute, which many people know just opened up, um, uh, a, well, really this week. Um, and, uh, and we had a grand opening uh, the week before. So welcome and uh, happy to have you. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending this uh, webinar. So very excited to share just of the press the uh, what's happening at the new Vision Institute. So as uh, Lonnie Snyder told you, we had the grand opening uh, less than two weeks ago, and uh, we started to see the first patient uh, on Monday. So this is really very, very new. Uh, scientists have not yet moved in. We are waiting for some final approval, so we should move into the building by June. So hopefully everything uh, in this building, and I will just give you a small hint of what is going to happen because there is nothing that could replace an in-person visit. And uh, we would love to have you come and visit and share with you the excitement and uh, all the new ideas and the new perspectives that are happening and are likely to happen in the coming years. So uh, this uh, building uh, resulted from a strategic decision that was made at the level of leadership at uh, UPMC and the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine uh, shortly after I joined Pitt in uh, 2016. This was not the initial plan, and uh, this was something which uh, really came as a wonderful development uh, once I started to share new ideas and also while I started to share the experience I had gained in the past in my previous life in Paris. And uh, this led to this idea of uh, creating an all integrated site where both clinical care, education, research, patient engagement, and even development uh, towards industry could be all merged into the same building in order to facilitate synergies and enable the development of new therapies for patients. Uh, so this is what happened, and this was following the model we had in Paris. So what you see on the left-hand side is the Paris Vision Institute, which uh, I built, not myself, but I really conceived and uh, happened under my leadership in Paris in uh, at the end of the 2000 years and was really, uh, I led it from 2010 until 2020. There was uh, some overlap with my role in, in uh, Pittsburgh. And uh, I'm still very much involved with them in many activities. It does currently include 300 scientists, and it's on the campus of the National Eye Hospital, the Kansvan National Eye Hospital, which is the oldest institution for the blind uh, in the world. On the right hand side of the slide, you see a place where a lot of companies that uh, stem uh, spun out of the Institute, but were the result of the research we had been conducted over the past years, 
we are, are hosted and develop products and therapies that are likely to benefit patients or are already benefiting patients. So the model is this integration, but in contrast to the Paris model where we built that within an existing hospital and the industry is uh, on the neighbor, in the neighborhood, the plan and the actual uh, already what is developing is that all is in one single building, which is a very large building, a 400,000 square feet building. Importantly, soon after we started to work on the project, a lot of synergies became pretty obvious with the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine, Physical and Rehabilitation Medicine, and uh, the Department of Physical Medicine is now also hosted in the SEAL building, and we have uh, synergies, and obviously we have also different types of activities, but this creates a spirit that is totally focused on patient well-being and enabling the therapies to improve the lives of our patients. The next slide, Ron. So the architect, uh, so one of the architects, uh, actually the main architect, uh, uh, unfortunately passed away a few weeks ago, was really the one who conceived a lot of the uh, big structure of the building and uh, listened so well to our ideas. But in the team, and this is one of the reasons why we selected that company, HOK, to build this place, is Chris Downey. He's now pretty well known. There was a 60 minutes about him. He's blind. He became blind uh, over in his life. He was not blind when he started as an architect, but he has actually used this uh, terrible situation as an opportunity for him and for patients to really make sure that buildings are developed and constructed according to guidelines that are making things much easier for the blind and visually impaired. And the spirit of building, and this is something we discussed many times with the uh, blind and visual rehabilitation services, our neighbor, uh, is really trying to improve lives and not just to provide in an acute situation some care, but really get alongside with the patient in the long journey they have through vision loss, impairment, and hopefully vision recovery. Next slide. So the building uh, is, uh, this is one of you, actually, this is a, a sketch. Uh, now you, you can see the real building and say it's very similar. This is what you can see when you look uh, from uh, the side opposite the river. And uh, there is what they call the vision tower where you have all the research on the ninth floor, eighth floor, seventh floor. The sixth floor is a shelf floor where we are going to host new activities, which could potentially be, for example, industry. The fifth floor is dedicated to administration and clinical trial. We have a dedicated area for clinical trial. The fourth floor hosts the rehabilitation uh, department and also the low vision uh, units, which are really amazing. But on the same floor, we also have all the education platforms, and we'll get back to, to that in a short moment. On the third floor, we have the surgical uh, areas with uh, and also the uh, refractive surgery and uh, dry eye ocular surface area. The second floor is all the subspecialties, and the ground floor hosts the inpatient uh, comprehensive eye service, the acute, uh, the acute clinic, a pharmacy, an optical shop, which is amazing, and uh, many units that are dedicated to welcoming patients. There is also, it's not yet open, there is going to be an uptown cafe, cafe that is going to be open to the public, hosting people who want to get into a building, not just for care, but also because it's going to be part of the neighborhood. Yeah, as you can see, there's a lot of technicalities in this building and the mechanical floors that are on the fifth floor and the 10th floor. Altogether, it's a 10-story building, a huge parking next to it for the staff and for patients. There's also a valet service uh, where patients are just being greeted at the entrance and brought to the right place with concierge and assistants. Uh, so we tried to get the architecture as integrated as possible into the neighborhood. And uh, we did that uh, because we didn't want this building to be totally foreign or extraneous to the neighborhood. So the brick architecture, and we try, although clearly this is a, a signature building, uh, really an iconic building, but at the same time, I don't think it's, uh, it looks totally foreign to this uptown neighborhood. So this is the entrance of Vision Institute. There is a driveway entrance, which means that there can be a drop-off of the patient just in front, and then they are hosted and greeted and brought to where they have to be seen. There is a, next to it the entrance of the acute care that you can see on the left in, in the purple, and then next to it the entrance of the rehabilitation area and low vision area. Next slide. 
So this is the lobby of the Vision Institute. Uh, the name of the lobby is uh, Daniel and Carol came in at Roman Lobby. Uh, so this is acknowledging the support we got from this amazing family uh, to what we are doing. And hopefully they are going to stay with us in the many years and really supporting us in many ways. And as you can see, this uh, atrium is uh, enlightened with a lot of windows, uh, very easy access. We have an access also people greeting you at the entrance. Behind them, you can see a piece of art that is very interesting, and we'll get back to the art program in a short moment, that is uh, responding to the sounds in the lobby. And this place, this, this piece of art is never going to be the same. Uh, it's permanently changing. And this is part of the spirit that uh, everything is changing constantly, hopefully for the best. Next slide. So on the first floor, we have uh, several retail spaces. One is the optical shop, and uh, please come and see it. It's uh, amazing. Uh, the pharmacy that is not only serving the building, but all the neighborhoods and Mercy Hospital. So it's a brand new pharmacy that is providing uh, any type of retail. There's also going to be a retail for, for uh, rehabilitation services and physical medicine, and an uptown coffee, which is not yet open. Next slide. So on the first floor, we have several clinical care. The comprehensive eye clinic, which is managed by Dr. Jake Waxman, uh, that is offering uh, uh, any type of care uh, for primary conditions and also screening a lot of patients and really providing a massive amount of care to patients. We have an outpatient testing area for pre-surgical uh, uh, workup of the patients uh, and the urgent care that is accessible directly and uh, is currently open only a few hours a day because we are recruiting the staff and the uh, advanced practitioners, but also the physicians that are going to cover for it. But the plan is to have it open extended hours and at some point in the future to have it open 24 seven. So anyone who needs a, an immediate advice or immediate care can get to this place. It's already open a few hours a day, but uh, it's going to be more than that. On the first floor, something you can see from the lobby, which is very important, is the uh, donor wall. So it's uh, acknowledging uh, there was, as you know, there is an ongoing campaign, which is not yet fully com complete, but has made a huge progress to support both the Department of Otorangology and the Department of Ophthalmology. So and this started in 2016 when I joined uh, Pitt and UPMC. And uh, through the leadership of the Ionia Foundation, uh, many people donated money and uh, the big names are not, but everyone is important in that. But you can see people that really gave a lot, foundations and individuals that uh, gave very large amounts of money. But many types of donations were given to support the mission. And this is being acknowledged there. And uh, for some of the donors uh, in uh, some parts of the building, as we will discuss briefly, and you heard already about the Cayman family. But for example, the Fox Center is acknowledged, the Salviti Family Foundation is acknowledged, and the, obviously the big foundation like the Burnshaw Foundation, the Hinman Foundation, the Sharky Mellon Foundation, and many others, uh, the Fine Foundation that supported us, but you'll hear from them uh, very briefly. Uh, and we'll have the opportunity to share more about that. Next slide, please. Uh, so art is integral to the building. And uh, this is something we can, we can see. This is an installation of art uh, in the building. And uh, this is uh, suspended pieces. This is in the uh, East Atrium that is leading to the rehabilitation low vision uh, elevators. And uh, each of these bottles that is suspended very safely contains a message that has been written by someone working in the department or in, at UPMC or at Mercy and uh, very moving messages, uh, greeting everyone to, to the building. Next slide, please. Uh, so the uh, art is integral to the building. This is something which is, I think, new in the institution. Instead of just buying some pieces and hang them, there was a small budget that was allocated for art in the building. So it's not that this building is a very expensive art building. It was really uh, giving a tone to the building. And there was a large international competition that was led by an amazing consultant, René Piekoki, and uh, working with uh, Many actually board members from the India Foundation, like Nancy Washington, members of the Uptown neighborhoods, members of the Carnegie uh, Carnegie uh, museums, and also staff members, physicians uh, from both departments. And art is all across the building. The goal is to help people to heal, to really showcase the science, showcase the hopes, 
and uh, support the access to care, enable people to have a better experience when they get to this place. So it's never pleasant to go to a hospital so that people feel that they are welcome. And this is a place that is going to be seamless for them uh, to feel more engaged and understood. Art is one of the best way to understand each other and also provide connection to the community. A lot of uh, visually impaired, but also mobility impaired artists were uh, actually selected. Also, this is a place where community can come and see and is welcome to do so. And we have a lot of new ideas about engaging the community from art and education and science. Next slide, a few examples. On the second floor on the left hand side on the top panel, uh, there is a tree. What you cannot see that this tree is constantly moving. It's made by an artist named Adams, who is an amazing artist that uh, has uh, both uh, engineering uh, training and artistic training. And this is in the main waiting room on the on the uh, seventh on the second floor, and you can see it moving constantly. You have a lot of the pieces that reflect actually the interaction you can have with art. Uh, one piece which is on the top panel on the right is uh, going to be activated very soon. Uh, a very young African-American artist, very promising, built this uh, series of arch around the theme of, a lune, of, of the moon and the lunar cycle over the month and the idea of lighting changing constantly. I already spoke about the lobby and what is in the lobby. There is also in the third floor in the OR area, a piece of art uh, that uh, has been developed by Shohei. And this piece is very interesting because it does represent photoreceptors and the, the move of light throughout it. So you can walk around the building and you'll see uh, all across many pieces of art that does reflect some message that we were hoping would be given to the community. Uh, other pieces that uh, reflect mobility. There is a sculpture that was made by a, that is, was made by a sculptor which who is actually blind. He is a veteran. A veteran. He lost his vision during the war. And so this is a sculpture that is in one of the gardens. Uh, and this sculpture you can touch it. There are pieces that were made by uh, Amy. Uh, we, we are reflecting different states of mind. So many pieces, it would be, I could spend the full time. We could probably invite Rene to talk about all the art in the building. Next slide. So the floors are designed around patient experience. We have all the subspecialties. We listed only a few, but we have all the subspecialties, not only glaucoma, retina, cornea, but also uh, mobility, neuroophthalmology, plastic surgery, dry eye, refractive, or any type of uh, care that would be needed. Uh, the imaging is just next, so the patient won't have to move back and forth between waiting rooms, and we try to make it as easy as possible. Uh, people are guiding the patient right to the location, and uh, you see again the tree on the right-hand side. And uh, this is now working. I mean, if uh, just while we speak, our patient, many patients being seen, and uh, we are ramping up on that. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. On the third floor, we have state-of-the-art surgical facilities. We have three-dimensional surgery, artificial intelligence-assisted surgery, laser-assisted surgeries. Uh, there's no single type of equipment that is not in these platforms. And it's all dedicated not just to be a nice new technology, but for the best possible quality of care. Next slide. So this is the type of technologies, the 3D surgery, uh, and as you can see, virtual reality goggles and the displays, uh, the, the cataract laser surgery, but we now have two new, uh, absolutely brand state-of-the-art models. And many other things. We have now, uh, for example, a, a wing dedicated for gene therapy and cell therapy with a pharmacy dedicated in the OR to facilitate the safety and the flow and uh, the efficiency. Next slide. So on the fourth floor, we have a lot of areas that are dedicated for education. And you'll see a few of these for educating uh, patient, practitioner, providers, and the community. Next slide. So these are the, uh, you can see this is currently the command center, but this is going to become the teaching area. Uh, we have uh, mini meeting, meeting places all across the building that are currently uh, very much used to, to, while we are going through the bumps of the opening and solving uh, many of the problems, which are being solved very efficiently currently at the system level. Next slide. There are several gardens. There is a winter garden that bears the name of the Fine family, Milton and Sheila Fine, 
amazing philanthropists that have been supporting us and uh, are really integral to the mission of the building. There is a surgical training laboratory, which is not fully finished currently. It is bearing the name of Ron Salviti, an amazing support of the department. And this is very appropriate because Ron Salviti, who is a leading ophthalmologist in the region, has also been a world leader in developing new surgical approaches, especially for cataract surgery. And uh, uh, really, uh, he, all his life has been pro providing the best quality of care and uh, helping us to really continue to do so and train the best people for the future. Next slide. We have a, a winter garden. We have outside gardens, a rehabilitation garden, also a recreational garden. There is a low vision area with uh, also a life skills apartment that is shared with the Department of uh, Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. So all of these areas are meant to help the people to cope with any type of impairment. And this is also associated with many new therapies for vision restoration, like artificial retina, optogenetic gene therapy. Very important, this is led by Will Smith, our amazing uh, low vision expert. And now we have more people working with him. Also, we have a wonderful occupational therapies like Holly Stance and a few others. Next slide. So the gardens are outside. Uh, so there's the winter and the outside. This is a recreational garden. And the flowers were actually prepared and maintained by the Western Pennsylvania School for Blind Children. This is an initiative I have to credit uh, Lonnie Schneider and Carrie Fogel because they established this connection and we have a very good partnership with them. And this is one of the examples. And this is going to continue. The flowers are going to be maintained by these blind children. And this garden is uh, meant to be used by staff and scientists, but it can also welcome events and visitors. And you see on the top right, some of the key members of the IND Foundation, the former president, uh, George Fechner, and his partner, uh, Christy, and uh, Louis Fox, who has been instrumental in many of the uh, projects and the future of this institution. Next slide. Uh, one of the uh, wonderful ideas that uh, were generated by the discussion with the architect is the collaborative staircase. From many parts of Pittsburgh, when you look at the building now, you see this uh, on the side, this staircase, which is uh, really bringing together all the floors, the clinical floors, the education floor, and the research floors. The goal of that is that people should meet, and as you can see on the images, there are places they can sit together, and this is outside of a box. This is also uh, enlightened by natural light, overseeing the, the rivers and the city, and this is a place where new ideas are going to be generated through many encounters. Next slide. Yeah, so the clinical trial unit is uh, opening now. It's on the fifth floor. It's fully equipped uh, to develop all the new approaches to therapies. It also contains the real life assessment that we will discuss in a moment. So this is a, a really great place for new therapies to be tested safely and efficiently. Next slide. Yeah, but part of what is on the fourth floor is the assessment of vision loss. So these are thing, images that are taken from the Paris Street Lab uh, that enables in real life to assess what's happening in many activities, mobility, target identification, obstacle, uh, obstacle avoidance, driving. Uh, so all of this is now being built in the, it's not yet fully implemented, but this is a part of the clinical trial area, and it's very well connected to the low vision assessment that we discussed a moment ago. Next slide, please. Uh, so the research floors on the sixth floor, seventh floor, and eighth floor, and uh, they are going to open uh, in the coming weeks. And uh, when we would like all of you to come and visit and meet all the scientists. We now have a, a very large number of scientists. You may have heard that we our ranking in, us, in research in the country has raised uh, dramatically over the past few years, and uh, we have recruited top scientists thanks to the support of the institution and the IND and the donors, and we intend to continue to do so in, in the coming years. Next slide. So we are innovating in many therapies. You see a few examples, uh, artificial retina on the top, uh, optogenetics, gene therapy, the cortical stimulation funded by the uh, Richard Kimmelan Foundation, the Beckway Foundation and the UPMC. Also a lot of projects funded by the Hinman Foundation that is also helping us to engage the community. Uh, the Department of Defense, the NIH, so a lot of activities to develop the therapies for tomorrow. Next slide. An important activity is that we want to act outside the building also. So we have a lot of engagement with the community. 
uh, we are working on community champions. We have a strong laboratory funded by the Hillman Foundation on social determinants of health together with School of Public Health. We now are part of the Mission of Mercy Two Days initiative that is an amazing initiative that occurs every year in Pittsburgh. And now last year we were able to provide free care to a thousand people, more than a thousand, provide free glasses given by the ACLO Foundation to more than 700 people uh, and more to come uh, this year. And now we have events all across the year. Recently, the Brothers Brother Foundation donated to the department an Ivan that is fully equipped to provide free care with street medicine. Uh, and this is a place where we work together with uh, all networks, not just UPMC, to provide free care. And I could spend a lot of time, and you had a wonderful uh, webinar actually on that uh, some time ago by some of the leaders, uh, Jake Waxman and Andrew Williams. And this is a priority for the department and for myself. We have a patient navigator, uh, Dana, who is amazing now in the, in the new building and hosting patients. And last year, she helped more than 500 people to access care for coverage, uh, transportation, child care, sometimes electricity, housing, amazing activities. Next slide. So I, I just want to conclude on something which is important to me. When I came to Pittsburgh, just uh, don't click yet, I came to Pittsburgh, I was told about the story of the building of a cathedral of learning. I was told that uh, it was decided to build that during while the uh, big crisis of 20, uh, 1929 was occurring. And to make sure that they would complete it, they decided to start by the top. They built it from the top down and to make sure that we would complete the full building over time. So the, the full uh, scaffold was built from start. This building was also a crazy idea, a dream that the institutions embarked upon. And I, and I used to quote this uh, statement by Henry de Vittoro that you can put on the screen, maybe Lonnie, uh, if you click, next slide. Uh, yeah, do not worry if you build your castles in the air, they are where, where they should be. Now you need to put the foundation. So I think now we have a foundation for many of our castles. And the main castle is the dream to restore vision and help all of us to cope with impairment and live better together. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, Dr. Sahel. This is uh, truly a, an amazing project, as we all know, but also something that when you came here to Pittsburgh, um, I know that this was not part of the plan. This wasn't part of the promise that this came uh, afterwards. Um, and uh, I, I have to say that you must have, um, you know, uh, you know, felt that, that, that the Pittsburgh has really rolled out the, the red carpet for you. But at the same time, this is one of those things that's really um, an amazing asset for the community and an amazing opportunity for everybody here in Pittsburgh to benefit from everything that's going to happen in this facility. And I think you did a great job expressing how all of that is coming to fruition. So uh, we have a lot of questions, Dr. Sahel, as you can imagine. I already see some very nice questions. And, and um, uh, so one here is, is related to um, uh, a little bit maybe of a personal question, but maybe Dr. Sahel, you can help us with this. That we know we're working hard to resolve AMD, but what efforts are being put forth for um, CSR, uh, CSCR? Um, so, uh, so it's a very specific question that is not fully related to the building, but actually we have one of the world experts, we have two of the world experts on this condition in the department, Dr. Shablani and Dr. Dan Singani. Uh, so it's a disease that uh, induces some uh, leakage of fluid in the retina, and uh, there are different approaches to treat it and to understand it. And uh, actually we have a very active team working on that, so uh, it's, I don't know how we'd have this question, but we could actually invite them to speak and give a webinar. It's a very challenging condition, but actually we have uh, some of the best experts in the world working on that in, in this department. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, I, I know that some people wrote in the press that this building is only about age-related macular degeneration. This is ridiculous. Actually, we are tackling all possible conditions, thousands of conditions, and you need a building like that. You, just, you don't just need a small office to do that. It's a, a lot of new therapies, a lot of new surgeries, a lot of new innovations. And this is to the top of the expectation. So something I said also at the grand opening, uh, like seven years ago, the American Medical Association, the most respected association in the world, conducted a survey across the US asking uh, all types of population, all types of ethnicities, what was the main concern they had in terms of health. 
And vision loss was number one, not number 50, as you may have read in the press. Uh, uh, agree. And, and, uh, and, um, I, and I know just from seeing people here every day, how much they appreciate the care that they receive here. And, and uh, obviously we're trying hard to make that really the best that, that can be in the world, but also advancing care at the, at, you know, for everybody that's um, struggling for every type of vision loss. Is this now, how does this rank in terms of size of vision centers in the U.S.? Would you say that we're amongst the biggest? Probably. I, I didn't compare fully, but uh, uh, anytime I talk with colleagues, uh, last week we had the Big Vision Conference, uh, and uh, people, are, they can't believe the numbers when we start to describe. And actually, it's much needed, but uh, I don't think we want to compete on the size. <laughs> it's not the best competition, <laughs> but we are certainly one of the largest in the world, yeah, I would say. Yeah. Um, and you touched on this a little bit in your presentation, but um, does UPMC have any plans to use the Vision Institute to help stimulate the uptown neighborhood? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, we uh, already we have a training program that is open to uh, anyone who wants to work in the in the department as a tech uh, at different levels. We are also accommodating a lot of students. We have this Hillman uh, Foundation program that where we are welcoming, greeting actually college students, but also even. Uh, from high school uh, to train them to be exposed to science and medicine. And uh, we intend also the uh, building to be open to the neighborhood, to be welcoming. We also, I'm planning to have a lot of discussion with the BVRS, uh, uh, Blind and Vision Rehabilitation Services, to take common initiatives, which we had discussed with the previous Meyer. I hope we'll be able to discuss also about opportunities for the neighborhoods in a constructive way, trying to really help everyone. But absolutely, I, I'm, we, our hope, and actually this was stated by one of the uh, representatives at the ground opening, is that the impact that the Children's Hospital had on Lawrenceville would be very similar in this neighborhood. And uh, as, as everyone knows, I, I selected this place for this building because I, I was thinking that this was the ideal place to be, and uh, that uh, it also would be much needed and much very helpful for the neighborhood. So a lot of ideas uh, to, to work together. And we met already with uh, many partners. Uh, actually, Sloney was with me at many of his meetings, and we are going to be happy to reactivate and now put all of these ideas to fruition. Yeah, it, it really is a special time, I think, for this region of, of the city. Um, and, and we are looking forward to those um, continued conversations. So um, a question about the patient navigator. I mean, how does somebody get connected with our patient navigator? Yeah, so she's in the building. Her name is Dana Ravich. She's amazing. Uh, we have also someone who is coordinating all the outreach clinic that we recruited recently. So I think uh, Loni knows knows her very well, <laughs> and mm -hmm. she will be, I think, very happy. She's also a wonderful person, not just uh, very helpful, but a wonderful person to meet. And she has so many amazing stories, uh, not disclosing any confidentiality, but uh, how important it is to help each other. You know, I one thing that's real um, noticeable to me when I've walked in the building is that there's some very nice people sitting up front, the, the concierge. And, and uh, tell us a little bit about um, how they're to help people when they come, you know, uh, through the door. Yeah, I think there's another question before on why was Mercy selected as the place oh, for the building. Yeah, yeah. Okay. so I mentioned the neighborhood. I also mentioned that uh, when I was recruited to UPMC, I was touring across all the sites because we, we have several sites. Currently, we have 13 locations, and I was going through uh, several of these sites. We had, a few, we had less at that time. And uh, I was very uh, annoyed with the difficulty to reach Oakland and the, the steep curve and the access. And I was looking for a place where it would, which would be easier access for people driving, but just flat and easy. And the uh, Mercy location looked great. But when I saw the spirit of the place, the nuns and uh, the history of the building, uh, the, I thought this was also a very caring spirit doesn't mean that the others are not, but I thought there was some specific spirit in this place. So I was so happy, uh, so happy to be able to convince that this could be the hub. At that time, my plan was just to increase a little bit the footage and to uh, improve the access. And then uh, the leadership, especially Leslie Davis, who is now the CEO, stepped in and said, well, why don't you build something? And I said, oh, of course. <laughs> and this happened. Uh, now, moving to the next question. Yeah, there is a concierge. There, is a, there are people at the entrance that are waiting for you uh, eagerly. They were trained and prepared to do so. And uh, so you have, a, you, people can drop you when, you, when you're here and uh, they can 
get you to the place and uh, at every floor there are people that are ushering you to the right place to go. I hope you won't get lost, but if this happens, obviously we want to learn from that and do it better. I can say it's a very easy building to navigate and I think they think it was well planned for sure. Um, will the new building allow for more clinical trials, Dr. Sal? Yeah, there will be a lot of new clinical trials. Actually, we are just waiting. Uh, we are transferring the existing trials. Currently, we have hundreds of trials. We have more than 100 trials, which is like five times more than when I came here. And we have plans for many more. Some therapies that we are developing ourselves. Also, many new therapies that are coming from other places that are going to come here. And because we'll have this very high quality platform with dedicated personnel. We have now an amazing staff and uh, and also techs that are fully trained and physicians. Yeah, a lot of new trials. Uh, safety become is still the most important thing for us, but obviously innovation is at the core of the mission. Here's a very practical question. If you have an eye emergency, would you still go to Presby ER or is there 24 hour emergency service here? So not yet. This is the plan currently uh, until the uh, October, I would say it's going to be only a few hours a day, but we have already a lot of access during the day, so you can still come in and or contact us. But uh, as of today, we still have our residents uh, covering the ED in Presby, but uh, we'll communicate when uh, everything is ready. Uh, the plan is to start with extended hours during the day, uh, probably uh, very extended hours during the day. And uh, at some point, I don't know when, uh, coverage during the night and the weekends. But as of today, you still have to go to the uh, to, to be to press BED, uh, unless you contact us to come for the acute care where you can be seen same day uh, in the department already. Thank you. I'm sure that's uh, very important for people to know. So um, we, we did talk a bit about, you know, why this location was chosen as far as this question, but anything about this neighborhood particularly, um, or even the, the access to where we are, uh, was that, did that factor at all into the decision to, um, yes, it did. It, it did. Uh, well, I have to say, I didn't know as much as I know now when I came, but I would do it even more if I, with what I know. When right. I, it was like a feeling I had at that time, which uh, surprised many people when I, I proposed that. Uh, it came as a surprise to many people because Mercy was not viewed uh, as a top hand a hospital, which is wrong. Actually, it's a wonderful hospital. And the team at Mercy is amazing. The directors and the, Mike Grace, who is no longer about Julie Hecker and now John Lynch and Santi, but it, it, tri it trickles down to all the people. There is this patient focused, patient driven mission that you can feel, which is across the system, but even more at Mercy. And I think the location is great also. It's easy, easily accessible from anywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. There is now a huge parking lot uh, and uh, also the Upton neighborhood is an, as an opportunity to grow and to flourish, but thanks to that. So I think it's going to be mutually beneficial. So a few comments here, one from a, someone we both know, just as not, no question, just a comment, phenomenal. Okay. And then Thank also you so much. Thank saying you. Uh, bravo, this is impressive on many levels and uh, I certainly agree. Um, can you talk more about urgent care for vision? What kinds of emergencies do you anticipate being able to help in better ways? Yeah, usually uh, urgent care is for people who have a painful eye or uh, acute loss of vision or anything that is bothering them that is not, they cannot wait to be seen. They have to be seen immediately. And it can be uh, very mild, very, very small things, but it could be also a very severe situation. So it's, it's a spectrum of, of condition. Anytime people think that they need to be seen, they, they should just call us or come in and uh, we need to make sure that we, we don't let anything go. So a few questions. So um, that are they're more personal health questions. Um, obviously, some you know some things on optic uh, atrophy as well as optic yeah. both an optic atrophy. Um, yeah. So yeah. So as you may know or not know, I've been working on optic atrophy or uh, developing a gene therapy uh, that has been applied now to more than 250 patients, uh, and we are still struggling to get the approval for this. But it's helping uh, more than 75 percent of the patient to recover useful vision, not perfect vision, but useful vision. So uh, dominant optic atrophy is another condition that has a mechanism of uh, disease that has some commonality with this one. So, so we are working on developing this approach. Uh, there are also other groups that are working on that. And actually, I was just approached uh, last week by a group that is developing a therapy for that. So we are 
going to discuss with them to uh, get a trial. It's not yet an approved approach, but uh, clinical trials on that. So yeah, a lot of work on these conditions. Well, maybe a, a follow-up question. This is for me is where would people, uh, is there some a site or a way that people can find out about the clinical trials that we're currently doing here? Yeah, it's a good idea. Uh, we we should probably try to post this. So they are posted on clinicaltrial.gov, but it's difficult to navigate through that. So maybe it's uh, some work for us to do together, Loni, to, to put that on the, on our website. Uh, of, in, of course, in the, uh, the information has to be accurate and understandable, so it's a bit challenging, but I think it's a great idea, actually. In the meantime, certainly um, feel free to contact us. You know, our, our the Ioneer Foundation, of course, you can contact um, through this website. And then we reach out to anybody that is, um, if, you know, if we reached out to the right people within the institution. Um, some of those questions specifically to your, your personal health issues, if you want to send those emails to Dr. to uh, Craig Smith, who uh, helps us set up the, the, uh, the webinar program, we'll get them to the right people. Can people from other states come for treatments? Well, we already have a lot of patients coming from uh, other states, uh, uh, and uh, we are ac accepting any patient. Actually, we're also working with many patients from foreign countries. Actually, we are working with UPMC International on developing a pathway for international patients because I, I, I get requests uh, from patients uh, from abroad, and some of uh, us, for example, uh, Dr. Nishal and many others, get a referral from out of the country, out of the state. So yes, we are ac accepting patients. Uh, some Sometimes we advise patients to see someone locally because they have outstanding people just next where, where they are, so there is no need for them to travel. But if they want to travel, they need to travel, we are doing that and uh, we accommodate that uh, actually all the time. Yeah. And then uh, will this building replace all the vision care efforts and treatment facilities at Mercy and Ioneer um, Institute? No, not really. Actually, what's happening is that we moved a lot of activities uh, uh, we moved all activities from Mercy Hospital to the building, uh, except the inpatient uh, room. We have a room for inpatient patients that cannot travel, so they are seen in this room. Uh, from the Ioneer, we brought in uh, here almost everything, but we left uh, neuro-ophthalmology, uh, Dr. Bonham, uh, plastic surgery, and some comprehensive ophthalmology. The reason for that is that we are we have a lot of multidisciplinary approaches working with the Department of Neurosurgery, Neurology, ENT, uh, and plastic surgery. So, uh, for example, uh, tumors of the, of the skull base are being operated by the four teams together very often, and uh, neurosurgery needs uh, to work with ophthalmology. So we left activities over there. And we kept all the satellites. So we still have Battle Park, Wexford, St. Margaret, uh, Natrona Heights, uh, Monroeville. And uh, actually we are opening new sites uh, because we need to cover it. And we have a big program that is uh, in the making for facilitating uh, access remotely to us uh, through partnering with uh, various physicians and caregivers across the state and beyond. Okay, and we'll, we'll, there's a personal question, which we'll answer. Um, we'll get someone to answer for you online. Uh, and, uh, and then, um, do you have any guesses on what the next big breakthrough in vision research may be? Yeah, well, it's always difficult to guess, but you can <laughs> see a few things happening. Actually, the previous question on labels of tick neuropathy, this is the condition where we developed the gene therapy approach and uh, applied it already to hundreds of patients. So very promising approach, but to be struggling to get it uh, approved and funded, but uh, working on it currently. Uh, so the next breakthroughs, we are working on vision restoration, as you know, uh, gene therapy and optogenetics. Uh, there are many breakthroughs in cornea currently with stem cells and other approaches. Several new drugs in glaucoma that uh, are happening and are being used in the clinic. Recently, there was a new drug that was approved for age-related macular degeneration that sounds promising. And uh, we have many things in the pipeline, actually, including uh, optic nerve regeneration, the Fox Center, and getting to the brain, the cortical vision project that is, uh, we are working hard to bring that to clinic. So it could be, uh, there will be a lot of webinars about uh, the new things we are doing and uh, others are doing. Uh, importantly, we should never think of this as an isolated place like uh, the tower that is totally disconnected from the rest of the world. We work with many networks. I'm involved with many networks of clinicians and physicians and scientists. And this is also bringing new ideas and uh, new opportunities. So how many doctors and researchers be working in the new building? So currently we have uh, 80 uh, faculty. 
uh, around 50 clinicians and 30 scientists, which is twice more than what we, when we had when I came here. And we are still we're working, thanks to the support we are getting from you actually into recruiting uh, more with the support of the school also and UPMC. Not because we want to be the biggest, we just want to cover every possible angle. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Is the IVN that you mentioned already doing stuff in the community? If so, how can we find out where? So they are. Uh, so there are some missions. You you can reach out actually to uh, to us, and uh, there are, these activities are led by Jake Waxman in the department. So we we can certainly maybe we could also this is a good idea post on the on the on the website the yeah. activities on a regular basis. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we'll send out um, you know uh, to this particular qu um, question here. We'll send out information on when of where those are being held. Um, is there residential housing for the blind being offered? So not in the building, the building is totally outpatient, but our neighbor, the Blind and Vision Rehabilitation Services, they have housing and they, they do an amazing job to house uh, blind people temporarily. They also help with transportation. This is a, a, I'm not sure they are as known as they should because they are doing an amazing job. I like this question. Dr. Sell, uh, if this institute wasn't guaranteed when you came to Pitt, what was it about Pittsburgh that drew you here? And uh, I, and I, I agree with this person's comment. They said, we feel lucky to have you. Well, thank you. It was very kind. Uh, actually, what drew me here was uh, really uh, initially uh, Dean Art Levin was uh, really wanting me to come. He made a, and a friend of mine who is uh, in L.A. who actually advised them to recruit me and uh, and Louis Fox. And this, uh, and the dean uh, is a very, is, the new dean is also very smart. The previous dean was uh, incredibly uh, uh, energetic and uh, willing uh, to really make things happen and uh, invited me, came to Paris, uh, and then the institution, UPMC, when they want something, they make it happen. So Jeff Romo, now Leslie Davis and the team. So I was impressed with the uh, the vision, the strength, and also the, the opportunity. And then I was promised to recruit a few people. They, I was promised I could refurbish and improve a little bit the, the platforms, but it went far beyond that. And uh, clearly, uh, and then we like the city, we like the people, uh, we, we like the community, and we felt uh, welcome uh, here. And I feel so, lucky too. I feel very lucky. Well, we, we really are very lucky. We know that. And um, and it's wonderful also that your families, you know, made their home here. Um, are there patient rooms in the in the facility for overnight stays? No, we don't. It's all overnight. It's all ambulatory, but uh, there are rooms in at Mercy. But most of the time, of time, it doesn't require any any bedrooms. I will say there is a bridge between this building yeah, and Mercy. There is a bridge. Yeah. So. Um, uh, I, yes, uh, this is a comment from Kathy. Works in the, we do have microsites on our what you there's for both grill eye service that do have some of the information about the uh, services in the community as well as um retinal dystrophy clinics, which would which would talk a little bit about some of the maybe some of the clinical trials going on. Um, is there any work being done on oh, optic regeneration after many years? If someone's yeah, we, we yeah, there is a, a lot of work. We have several scientists. This is what we call the Fox Center for Optic Nerve Regeneration. So we have a team with uh, several scientists we recruited from Columbia University, from Stanford, from uh, uh, St. Jude. Also, uh, we this is very well integrated within the department with many other scientists. So this is very active and there are uh, several programs that are ongoing. It's a very complex uh, situation, so don't expect fast answers, but work in progress. You still work with the Vision Institute in Paris? Yeah, a lot. Yeah, we, we still have a lot of interaction. We have joint uh, teams uh, on imaging, on gene therapy, on uh, cortical uh, stimulation. Uh, actually, a lot of the achievements that uh, Vision Institute in Paris has generated are coming to Pittsburgh. Many of the first in human trials we did actually came from that research. Uh, it has been part of my life. I'm still very connected to them, but obviously I'm fully engaged here and involved here. But many opportunities. There was a question on uh, myopia, for example. There is an institute for myopia that is being implemented in Paris, and uh, I'm advising them very strongly in uh, developing these approaches at the clinical and preclinical level. So this is going to be benefit us. So the, the world is without bounds and we should uh, accept that as a as an opportunity. And uh, there were, as the ground opening, we had a lot of people that came from France 
the dean is coming to Paris very soon actually to uh, visualize what is the opportunities. And we are working on a joint uh, student degree, a PhD degree between the two institutions, between Sorbonne and Pitt, which uh, probably the first students are going to start uh, next year. We already have a few PhD students from Paris, but uh, it, it's going to be both ways. Uh, so, and uh, as you may not know, also a lot of partnership with Japan and Germany and England. Seems like we, a very popular question today is about clinical trials. So I think you're right. We probably uh, will try to provide more information about what's going on and, and how people can get hold of the people in the clinical trials office. And yeah. now that you have also a, a, a place specifically here for clinical trials, that's, um, it'll be even, e even easier to find out how to get information. Okay, I think we covered all the questions. There, there was one I skipped and held for last, but someone asked about how to get on, how to get on the donor wall. Um, if if that was if if that was a setup, I appreciate it. Um, we, we, the the minimum level for people on the donor wall is a ten thousand dollar donation, but it can be done over a pledge. Um, and we're very very fortunate. We've had incredible support um, for this campaign that we've we did start when Dr. Sal arrived, and we did it particularly because of the need to really grow everything around this building. We're very also fortunate. UPMC did build this building and. And they didn't ask for any support from our foundation. Uh, we really were able to, to um, apply our support towards what Dr. Sal and his teams want to do to advance care for patients with vision loss. And um, and we feel very satisfied that we're getting very much a lot out of our investment by what you see and what you hear about from these webinars. And um, we're happy to bring these to you every week. And we're really happy that you're able to join us today. So uh, they can add that also the, the ENT department has always been uh, absolutely amazing and now has a new chair with a, has a lot of new ideas. So the campaign that uh, the ENT Foundation is conducting is for both departments and, yeah. Uh, yeah. and uh, actually there are a lot of synergies that could come from that. Uh, people losing vision and hearing through age or genetic condition, many ideas. And uh, so it's a huge opportunity. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and again, you'll, you'll hear about both departments as we do these webinars every week, every other week. And um, thank you. It, it really is a pleasure. It was a pleasure to have uh, somebody join us today. And um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank, thank you. you Dr. Thank you. Thank you.